All right, everyone, the big news of the day is something. It's it's a bright spot on a dark sort of foreign policy slash diplomacy scenario in Asia. Uh, because really, other than getting along with China, we've had problems in the last few years. It's not Trump related. It's been a problem for years beforehand with Obama, uh, with Asian policy. Really, Obama showed weakness for the most part in Asia. Other, despite having an Asian swing, so-called, which never emerged, it was a, he, he was too busy dicking around in Egypt and Syria and places like that and ruining the Middle East. He's too busy with that to worry about Asia. Other than sailing a destroyer uh, near the Spratly Islands that China said, stay away, and he's like, no, fuck you, I'm, our Navy can penetrate this region anytime it wants. Other than that, there were no major Asian foreign policy sort of chops in Obama's entire administration. Trump has done respectively better, but there have been remaining problems, mainly in the DPRK, the problem with Duterte deciding on a day-to-day -day basis whether he likes Trump or, or Jinping or maybe Putin and who he gets along with and who he threatens to annihilate. Like, he threatened China, and China's like, what the fuck are you talking about? Then he turns around and says, oh, China's my buddy now. Trump is like a dog or something. Uh, it's just gone crazy. And I like Duterte, but, you know, he's got to have a little bit less chaos. Like, that's a little too excessive. Like, that's beyond Trump levels of chaos. It goes crazy. But Kim Jong-un now has cracked uh, and said, oh, yeah, I, you know, the DPRK comes out and says, oh, yeah, in South Korea, oh, yeah, we'll meet with Trump. Now, this comes on the tail, uh, really, you know, Trump. Uh, send some people over there and, and uh, Kim Jong-un's sister actually was there in South Korea meeting with them. Didn't look very happy about it, but that was a symbol of possibility. The possibility of diplomacy exists there. Now, I am still very, very skeptical whether Trump can achieve denuclearization. I don't think it's going to happen. Sanctions have not worked in the past. Even with China aboard, the prospect of both China and the U.S. getting directly involved in a military sense has to freak out Kim Jong-un. He's never going to show it in public. He's never going to admit to it. Behind closed doors, he's concerned. That much is clear. But you can't collapse the DPRK, I think, entirely, even if China's fully aboard, and they're not. And then you have Russian smugglers involved. Of course, there's a little bit of a, a border there, a few miles of land and some maritime boundary uh, between Russia and North Korea. It would be, it's easy for Russians uh, in that region to say, hey, China's no longer trading. We can charge a 10% surcharge, make bank, and get those minerals into China. We can smuggle them. Now, it'll be easy. Like, what are they going to do diplomatically about it? You threaten us? Threaten nuclear war over smuggling with the DPRK? It's never going to happen. Russia's, you know, a little bit too strong to deal with China dickwagging in that direction. By the way, there are people within China. They're like, oh, yeah, you know, make 10 times the average yearly salary by smuggling some fucking rocks. Why wouldn't I want to do this? You know, some homeless itinerant merchants like, yeah, and my wagon so, so doesn't have any contraband in it. It's just fucking turnips. <laughs> Don't look underneath them. And then, of course, you pass a note off to the cop at the border uh, and you get it through. He gets a little bit of money. You get to ship your stuff in. So he brought he takes a little this is the way communism works. Uh, everyone takes a little bit of a cut. Now, this is also the way that uh, interventionism works here. It's called taxes. Uh, in an involuntary sense there, it's called, hey, you've got to bribe somebody. Oh, yeah, you give me a couple shots of vodka, you know, says the friendly uh, neighborhood watchman, and I won't accidentally claim that you uh, tried to rape this woman and get you thrown in jail so that I can steal uh, the, your, your wallet, basically. This is what happens. It's sort of strong-arm politicking. It's no different from the way we do it. We do it with a suit on. Uh, they do it with a club to your head. This, that's the only real difference <laughs> between, between a, a less developed and a more developed nation. Here, the people that want to club you over the head, break your kneecaps, wear a suit. You know, because they do it. It's more efficient. Uh, but Kim Jong-un meeting with Trump, that would be quite significant. If it actually happens. Now, it's planned for May. Whether it happens or not, you know, still up in the air. Whether any progress is made is totally up in the air. Prob I would be, again, skeptical about anything beyond. Uh, they meet together. They pose for the camera next to each other. It's a lukewarm sort of situation. And vague promises are exchanged that, you know, are dragged on for years. Trump has to be careful with the fact that the, the North Koreans negotiate in very much the same way he does. Now, he's already gone all in and threatened, basically, well, I have a bigger red button than you, and it actually works, and we've got carriers in the region, China's aboard now, I can shake hands with Xi, he's a great guy, he's helping us in North Korea, 
Uh, you know, we would, you know, the North Korea would be completely destroyed if they do anything. Don't you fucking uh, threaten Guam. You're not going to like the results. So he's already gone on in. He can then withdraw halfway, say, okay, we're just going to go back to the lukewarm sanctions, but we need to see progress from you. Get him to do a half-assed partial denuclearization, maybe. The problem is you can no longer physically compel North Korea to do so. You can't do it. They've got the H-bomb. It's impossible to physically compel them. Now, you could probably preemptively strike and prevent a nuclear war in the, in the situation. But why would you want to? It'd still require killing hundreds of thousands of North Koreans. That would be under the best of circumstances. You have the risk of nuclear reprisal, or at least an artillery-based reprisal that kills a few hundred thousand, maybe a couple million more people in South Korea, maybe hits Japan with chemical and biological weapons, uh, even if the nuclear stockpile is... Let's assume that there is no nuke stockpile, that it's all just a total lie and that these weapons they're testing are the only ones they've ever had. They don't even have a working A-bomb right now. Okay, they do have a chemical stockpile. They do have a bio stockpile. They do have missiles that are feasibly capable of hitting Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, China, Russia, everything within the region with them. Even if they can't hit the US mainland, they can certainly hit Hawaii. They can certainly hit Alaska. They can hit parts of coastal Canada. They can. They can hit targets. Probably, as far, they probably hit India with a missile if they wanted to. What happens if Shania or something is hit with a, a botulism warhead? Yeah, I think it'd be a, a pretty sickling, uh, sickening scenario. And the DPRK has these weapons. We know that. Uh, they openly brag about it. They also, also brag about nukes. That's more, you know, it's basically, they've got atomic weapons. At least the capability of making them. What's the stockpile? Maybe not sure. H-bomb seems likely now. Nobody wants to deal with that situation. What I would say is though it is a historic moment since Clinton, nobody's actually been able to meet with, you know, the head of North Korea. So that's a, a brownie point number one. Number two, North Korea has sort of half-assedly backed off the threatening posture and is now in a receptive posture. That's brownie point number two. Brownie point number three is look at what the lamestream media is saying. Oh, this could actually hurt the situation with North Korea. Trump's not capable of negotiating with them because he's stupid. It's, it's like, what are you talking about? Obama never got uh, Kim Jong-un to say, oh yeah, you know, maybe we can meet in South Korea. That never happened. Trump couldn't even get China, lukewarm ally at the time on the situation as it was, to roll out a carpet for him and greet him at the airport. He lands at the airport, he's got like a couple of Chinese guards are there and nothing else. He has to walk to his car. Yeah, that's really, really dignified. No, that's how they treat. That's how uh, Southeast Asian politics is basically, no, you'll be shown great respect, great deference if you've deserved it at all. If you look like a weakling, don't expect bullshit. Instead, Trump goes to China and they, they pull out all stops. It's like a New Year's celebration. You know, you probably didn't see it because, again, the U.S. media didn't want to talk about it at the time. If Trump goes to South Korea, shakes hands with Kim Jong-un, if he can get in the same room with the heads of North and South Korea at the same time, there's possibility of progress. There's the vague possibility of avoiding an otherwise eventual nuclear war within the peninsula. The lamestream media here uh, is, is basically saying they would rather 10 million people get annihilated, get nu and vaporized by nuclear weapons, than admit that Trump is at least trying in Asia. They would rather that happen. I think they'd rather have a World War III scenario than admit that Trump's good on the economy. They don't even talk about it. Look, when's the last time they mentioned anything about jobs reports or wages? They don't want to talk about it because they have to give them credit for it. It's the Trump economy. Now, and, and also, I'll say this. Having a stronger economy gives us more diplomatic leverage. It means we're buying power. Uh, it means more leverage in the military department, potentially, and pay for more goods. And so that's, uh, it's indirectly, it definitely helps with our uh, diplomacy within Asia. You know, if the, the U.S. is falling off of a cliff, nobody wants to deal with you. It's like, you know, they're like, oh, hi, you know, you're the, you're the former power. Uh, you're the one that we used to be worried about. Now we can sort of poo-poo you and we can mistreat you when you come for... Your dignitaries come and we sort of ignore them, give them the cold shoulder. We say, oh, yeah, we'll meet with you tomorrow. Go to your fucking hotel room. Maybe we'll spy on you because you can't do anything about it. Now it's like you command a little bit more respect, I think. And that's a good thing about Trump's overall uh, demeanor. Really, the, the master negotiator thing, it's strictly out of art of the deal. It's like a big ask. Uh, and then you pull back a little bit and you're getting most of what you want, presumably quite a bit more than the other person is getting. With the diplomacy with North Korea, it's basically, I will nuke you. And then you're like, oh, maybe I won't nuke you, but I want to shake your hand. I want to get a feel for you. Let's meet. 
looks great on the domestic stage. It's certainly going to command more respect than what Obama 